We'll go ahead and get started with our gas metal arc welding. So GMAW, I know all these acronyms, Gamma, Pa, Grandma, seems like, I don't know, all these things. All right. <clears throat> so gas metal arc welding, uh, most people call it MIG for metal inert gas, uh, which means you have a shielding gas. With the stick welding, the shielding gas was inside the flux, and that kind of covered the weld and mixed with that and got all the impurities to float on the top that you chipped off. And I've got some welding videos that I'm going to have and they'll have some handouts too that you have to follow and we'll have quizzes on those. And then I'll actually show you people welding and what it's all about for some of you who haven't welded before. So don't go like get real apprehensive and say what is all this crap? I don't know anything about this. Yeah, you're okay. You're alright. Trust me. You're not supposed to have any prior knowledge of welding before you start this class so you're fine so if you need this for elective if you just follow along all of the quizzes follow my lecture so you'll be fine there won't be any issues all right so anyhow back to this this has one of those big cylinders that you get uh, that you rent or you can purchase one and they fill it up with gas uh, whether it's um, <clears throat> compressed air, CO2, whether it's argon, or then they have a mixture of the three, and we'll get more into that. But that's what we're talking about, that. That uses that bottle, okay, they have the big cylinders there, uh, and that is the shielding gas for it. And what's nice about the MIG, because you have that bottle and that, and it's not in some flux coating, you don't have to chip anything off. So, But you have this gas you have to deal with. So if you're just trying to weld something quick, uh, you don't have to lug around one of these big cylinders of gas, uh, bottles, if you will, uh, then the stick welding is nice. It has its advantages in having to deal with all that. So. Anyhow, an electrode arc welding process in which an arc is struck between a consumable wire. Now you have this big wire that's on a spool, electrode, and the workpiece. Shielding is provided by some type of inert gas, per se. All right, the constant voltage, the whole reason for this is, and I told you, in World War I, they went from riveting ships together, and that's why they always had bilge pumps and all that. Uh, the big battleships and that, they're always leaking, all right? You rivet something together, you're not going to get a perfectly tight seal. So it's always leaking. And, you know, and still ships leak wherever things are. There may be issues somewhere. And you'll see bilge pumps that pump the water out of the hull of the ship. But, I mean, it was really bad. They were always running and uh, <clears throat> pumping all that out because, you know, if something's riveted together, it's going to leak a little more than if it's welded shut perfect. It's like if you had an oil pan and you've got one of those racing oil pans and they, they cut it and they add that extension to it and they weld it. You know, usually you get a perfect seal, although I got one that leaked, a little pinhole leak, which was not good. But can you imagine if they riveted that thing together, your oil pan? Yeah, you'd be leaking oil all the time. So, anyhow. So, they got better and they came up with stick welding to weld the ships and even... <laughs> Excuse me, and even tanks together uh, towards the end of the war. And so everything was a cleaner process. But then they said, oh, this is kind of slow and everything else. And then they came up with this constant voltage idea. So in, 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 in 49, so we're, you know, kind of after World War II. Okay. And with these, you have your generators. And then you have the in 50 transformer rectifier developed. And we'll get a little more into this in a second here. Generator machines were too slow to respond to the changing arc conditions. So they said, yeah, what can we do here? And so and then you had the constant current wire feed machines had voltage sensing drive motors for wire speed control. Now, the higher the voltage signal, the faster the motor would run. As the arc length decreases, the voltage decreases, and the motor slowed down. About that. Very difficult to obtain quality welds. All right, so this is kind of they were basing it on the constant current, uh, like in your stick 
welding and then TIG welding, which we'll talk about as well, which uh, a lot of TIG welders are also, you can use as stick welders. Uh, so. so anyhow, they thought, well, we got to do something else for this wire feed. It's not working real well. So the basis of operation, the entire commercial electric power system, like, you know, in your house, same voltage is maintained, but the current flow depends on the resistance. So we're having constant voltage, you know, like you have 110, 120 in your house. I don't know if you've measured it's anywhere from 107 to 125, depending on how things are going. <laughs> but it should be around 110, 115. Uh, when resistance changes, the current changes. All right, so most MIG welding is done on direct current reverse polarity, so DCRP. Now this kind of shows you a picture of one. I got a picture of a Miller, just because I kind of like that name. No, but Miller makes pretty decent. They have a reputation for uh, their wire feed MIG type setups. Uh, I, I think uh, Lincoln has the best stick welders and, and some other welders. Hobart's more your larger scale subarc and other things. Uh, they all make everything pretty much now because everybody wants turnkey systems where if you're going to start let's say a welding lab or uh, in your company weld all these things you need small welders large welders you got to be able to supply all of them say oh we can only supply them people go you know I don't want to deal with two suppliers but anyhow they are known and they work really well the Miller ones uh, if they do break it's easy to fix them clean up the garbage and they all come apart real quick and easy I like the access to them all and don't have many problems with them Alright, so the wire feeder, which is this part here, just has a little electric motor is what they're saying. Simple 110 motor driven at a constant speed when welding. <clears throat> the gun can be air cooled if you're doing the smaller wire and whatever, and then water cooled and heavy amperage if you're doing some thicker wire, doing some real heavy duty welding. And if you're welding all day long, and that's the other thing, you'll look at the duty cycles. So how long can this thing run before it gets too hot and it's, it almost shuts itself off and you got to give it a break. And usually a lot of times uh, what they do is they make the spools certain sizes too. So then you have to change the spool and in changing the spool that takes time and that helps uh, count for your duty cycle where it's not doing anything so it's cooling off. So anyhow this is just a schematic of a water cooled one and has you know these copper here, here's your electrodes in here and then it has these uh where is it this thing yeah here's your gas input water in water out you know just basically to cool it uh we had some bigger guns when i was working at a and m down there in college station and uh we run them through. In fact, we run antifreeze in all of them to keep them from. And so it just depends on what you want to do. Now, this is interesting. Here's your globular spray and short circuit. So depending on how much you juice this thing up, uh, bump it up in uh, your amperage and what have you. Uh, here, if you look at this one, you have globular where it's uh, below 200 amps and you're using CO2 which is very inexpensive as the shielding gas all right you know, it's like the CO2 the carbon dioxide that they they put in your sodas to make it bubble and stuff like that <clears throat> all right so it's fairly inexpensive and it's good for mild steel it globs it down you do get more spatter than these other ones but if you're doing a lot of welding uh, and you're making inexpensive parts, this is the way to go. Just glob those beads down there. And you see that it's, it's not vaporizing it as much. It's big globs coming out here. Uh, you look at short circuit, shallow penetration here. This is, you know, for thicker pieces here. This is when you really have low 
amperage. So even way below 200 amps. And this has shallow penetration. The reason being is that way you can weld sheet metal. Because if you, the more amps, obviously the more heat you're going to get. And then it's going to burn right through, burn holes through the sheet metal. So, And there's slope control switches on some of them, you know, better ones. And then uh, use a thinner wire, uh, you know, 045 or less. You know, there's 035, you know, you name it. <coughs> Um, this one, the spray, where it really vaporizes, it's more of a spray. See how they're smaller. It's above 200 amps, the deep penetration here. And then you're using argon. Argon gives you better, less spatter, and gets a hotter arc, and gives you, allows for deeper penetration. So anyhow, short circuit, uh, wire shorts on the metal. You know, that, 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 you know, you'll notice the difference in all these welding thin materials, attached car border panels, all positions, and it's from 100 to maximum of 200 amps. Excuse me. The spray, the wire vaporizes. This is your hotter setting as it leaves the gun. High heat buildup and metal transfer above 200 amps, limited to flat and horizontal because it's getting so it's going to run on you. So you don't want to do overhead welds or even verticals. They'll kind of run on you too much. Uh, it's kind of more of a pulse spray. When we get into pulsing and that, and then we'll get into plasma, it gets hotter and hotter and vaporizes more and more. Very stable arc with very little spatter. I mean, it gives you a nice, beautiful weld. Good for welding stainless steel and aluminum. Um, and the deal is, obviously, stainless steel... Uh, and aluminum, you want a cleaner, nicer, good-looking weld than those. Because usually a lot of times, if you weld them correctly, you don't have to do anything to the welds. You don't have to grind them or anything. And all just looks perfect, and especially stainless steel, a lot of the restaurant equipment, all that. You want it to look pretty. Because stainless steel is pretty expensive. You get the good quality stainless steel. I know I bought a piece of sheet metal. I think it was 3 by 10 or something. It was like 30 bucks. I bought a piece of stainless, good quality stainless, you know, where it's got that mirror finish to it. And it was $300. So, you know, there's a big difference. And even aluminum's a little more expensive. But it gives you a better uh, look. And and it'll do deeper penetration. And, and, and stainless, you know, it's harder. Um, and so you got to get it hotter to get a good weld. And then the globular uses core wires, uh, and we'll get more into that, around 200 amps, inexpensive because CO2, like I said, is the shielding gas, which is, and look at this, 15% of the cost of argon. So, you know, if you got a flow rate and you're doing this, running these beads all day long in that shielding gas, and then helium is even better too, but think of it, helium, you know, how it it's in balloons, it's... It's lighter than air. Well, think about it. If you're you're running helium, it's all going to want to go up. So you have to have higher flow rates to keep the helium there. So that gets even more expensive. Uh, <clears throat> leaves excessive spatter uh, because you are vaporizing it. But uh, it's, it's good. It gives you real deep penetration here. Uh, high deposition rates, 250 inches per minute. So it's pretty good. Limited to flat and horizontal. Uh, CO2 inexpensive, 50% of cost argon, mainly used for mild steel. And then you have these mixes in these uh, bottles or cylinders of gas that you get. 75% and then 25%. So argon CO2 mixture. And then you have tri mixes argon, helium, and CO2. Mainly used for stainless steel, seems to work best for that. They, they, done all these and, it, and you can try them and experiment I mean like I said you can weld with a coat hanger but it's not going to be pretty and it's going to be very difficult to do it so over the years they've tried all these different things and find out what's good what they can supply what they can have on hand for you and make your life easier that's reasonable and cost effective since you are making a, a product that you have to make a profit off of you don't want to use the most expensive everything so you look at argon, stable welding arc, reduces the spatter because especially when you're doing um, the, where was it here? 
Yeah, the spray. If you look at the spray, since it's the hottest, you know, that stuff's going to vaporize and splatter or spatter, same thing, all over the place. So you want something, some type of gas that's going to help you reduce all that spatter or splatter. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it gives you a little lower penetration, but it is hotter and lets you do, um, <clears throat> lets you do because it does reduce the spatter. You can goose it up and you can get a hotter arc and then you can get deeper penetration. I know you're saying, well, what's this? Yeah, well, 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 then you can bump up the amperage. <clears throat> All right. And this is a schematic of the MIG welding. Again, your gas cylinders, bottles, tanks, whatever you want to call them. Um, <clears throat> your gas lines in here. Uh, and then you have your wire feeder. You know, there's little things to clean it and all that. And then there's your welding. I guess they're doing a backhand here. See, there's how he's holding that, or if you pushed it forehand. All right, the electrode holder. And there's certain angles you got to hold it. See, here's the gun, there's the trigger. They push the button, a little wire comes out. You better be ready. Have the right gap. You know, it just depends on what you're welding, eighth to a quarter of an inch away. And try to hold that gap, and then if you if you just push the button and then keep a certain speed, constant speed of moving that, you're in good shape. Uh, again, this isn't like a, we'll get more into TIG where it's brighter, you can see everything. But this thing's too easy. I, I always had issues with it at first because I started with stick and TIG. You know, and then TIG, you can see everything. And here it's kind of dark, and you just have this big glob of stuff, and you don't know what's going on. But it's the easiest, really. It's the easiest method to do the MIG. <clears throat> this shows you the different types of wires that are involved here. Electro and this is 70, so that's your tensile strength. Uh, and then if you look at it, you've got S's and U's. I think it's got all the listings here. And there's a solid wire. <clears throat> and what does it have here? CO2, yeah, carbon dioxide, argon, and if you look at these AO, argon and oxygen, plus 1 to 5 percent oxygen, so it's telling you um, kind of what shielding gases work best with this. Um, okay, let's see what else. So, again, tensile strength, E for electrode, S for solid wire, and then the last one tells you what chemical composition and shielding works best. So it uses a consumable wire electrode, all right, that's on a spool. Uh, uses shielding gas, which we talked about, whether it's argon, helium, uh, carbon dioxide, or mixtures of those. Results in a uniform weld bead. Uh, weld bead is slag free because you you actually have a shielding gas that comes out of a a uh, bottle, and so you don't have to chip off any slag. So once you're done welding, you just look at it and say, "Wow, that's beautiful." It is commonly used for automatic welding too. Get these things set up. I know we got, uh, we just had purchased one of those uh, FANUC robots and they set those up with um, Lincoln. Last time we were at Cleveland for a conference, we toured the Lincoln plant there and they used FANUC robots for welding. So they set up their welders with that once you got it set up. I know they, uh, the, the instructor there, uh, what's his name, Cody Edwards, at uh, Kilgore College, they just got a new setup with one of those welders with the FANUC robots and all. He was showing me that the other day when I went over there for advisory committee meeting, so it's pretty neat. Um, <clears throat> and then this just gives you a schematic of all the different things that are involved with it. I won't go over it all, but you can look at it. So the advantages of your MIG welding, gas metal arc welding, same thing. High deposition rates when related to shielded metal arc welding or stick welding. Now, I'm repeating these a lot just to make sure for some of you are new to this. So all these acronyms seem the same, and so we're just reviewing them. 
because stick welding, remember, once you weld down that stick, that electrode, then you've got to stop, pick up another one, flip your, you know, your welding hood helmet up and get another one, line it all back up. And on the other one, that spool just keeps running until there's a kink or there's an issue or something. But usually if you keep everything clean and nice, it works really well in your tip clean. Um, so you have high utilization of your filler metal Elimination of the slag removal, and that's time. Time is money, so that's nice. Reduction of smoke and fumes. Maybe automated for high production. Lower skill level required, which is good. It's hard to get welders anymore, so that way you can train them in-house real quick and then move on. Extreme versatility and wide range of applications. Okay. Like I said, you can weld aluminum, stainless, regular metal, so it's nice. It works out well. We had a little miniature gun that actually had the little spool built into it for aluminum and used to weld like that. That was kind of neat. Uh, limitations of your MIG welders here, gas metal arc welding. Distance of the power source to the welding area can be a problem. Uh, and uh, because of the power supply and the, sh the cylinder, the bottle of gas that you have, strapped to it, you know, maybe an issue. Equipment is higher priced than obviously a stick welder. Difficult to weld with in a, a drafty locations if you think about it. Yeah, if the wind's blowing all the time, then your shielding gas is going to blow with it. <clears throat> so obviously you'd have to put up some little makeshift walls to break the wind if you're doing that. All right, now we're going to talk about flux core arc welding. So, you look at the definition of electric welding process. Basically, well, I'll go into this. Coalescence is produced by heating with an arc between continuous fed consumable uh, shielding is obtained with an electrode. Additional shielding may. Okay, what this is, is you had the MIG welder, which we just talked about. But now we're putting a flux. And usually the flux, instead of it being on the outside, they crimp that metal and make it a hollow tube and they put the flux inside which I'll show you and then because of this then you don't need a shielding gas anymore so these are for where you don't want to have to worry about the bottle and having to deal with all that stuff you know let's say you're out in the field and if you just had and you don't mind chipping off the slag later and then using a wire brush to clean it all up um, and we'll show you with the chipping hammer, but if, you, if it's done right, it usually just flakes right off once you just hit it a couple of times. And then wire brush it to make it look pretty. Um, then this is the way to go, the flux core. It's the same It's the same setup. You can just put flux core wire in a MIG welder, and then you've got flux core. Yeah, I used to look at these and say, ooh, what's the difference? That sounds so good. No, that's all it is. But you can also put a shielding gas on it. If you're doing some special wells, they have to be x-ray quality or whatever. And then that way you know you've got a beautiful well. So you can also have that shielding gas. So that way you have two. And it just shows you. And then you're creating that molten slag. And then the slag solidifies and you have to chip it off later. But you can see that it's a flux core. So you have your steel on the outside and it's hollow. And then you have your flux in the inside set on the outside on a stick welder. You know, just to, and then this just kind of shows you, well, how do they get the flux inside of that? You know, it's like when you're watching how they make donuts or whatever. But here you see they have a flat strip of wire, steel, I should say. It's not wire yet. It's flat strip of steel and then it goes through these uh, rolls, rollers, and it continuously bends it up and around. Do you have a hollow wire uh, and then this is well this one it's u-shaped now and then you fill it with flux and then you bend it continuously keep bending it around and then you have your hollow wire and it shows you different there's heart shaped ones the way they make them they lap them or it's just butted together to get a nice tight butt fit so anyhow that's somebody asked me how do they make that wire so that's why I'm showing you dual shield there you go yeah a lot of times it's called dual shield the flux core All right, dun, dun, dun. and then if you look 
flux core, here's E for electrode, 70 for the tensile strength, 60 on that one. T for tubular, tubular man, right? All right, T is for tubular because it's a tube. It's a hollow tube that has the flux in it. I don't know why they just didn't put an F for flux core, but that's what they did. And then the different types for if it's better for aluminum or whatever. So, anyhow. And this kind of shows you. Uh, we know this is a flux core G, the highest deposition rates uh, out of position uh, type welding. Uh, and if it's an 8, highest deposition rates out of position without a shielding gas. Some work better with the shielding gas. Uh, highest deposition rates here in a flat position uh, with Sharpie properties. So, let me see this one. 14. Fastest travel speed on galvanized and coated. So, it just depends. You'll see these numbers and you'll wonder which one's better for what. And just tells you there. It should tell you obviously on the box that you get them in. Alright, so the advantage of your flux core arc welding, high quality weld metal deposit, excellent weld appearance. Yeah, when you chip off the slag, it looks good under there. It looks really sharp. Welds a wide variety of steels. Yeah, and it tries to keep all the spatter inside too. They, they come out pretty good looking. Well, it's a wide variety of steels over a, 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 a wide thickness range. Easily mechanized as well. High deposition rates, high travel speeds, visible arc, easy to use, and less pre-cleaning required than with the gas metal arc welding, you know, where you should wire, weld, and clean out uh, the V grooves or whatever, the butt joints, before you weld them. Uh, this, since it has all that flux in there for clean out the impurities, you're okay. Now the limitations of it, use only for ferrous metals, all right, for, you know, steel type stuff, iron. Produces slag covering that must be removed when you didn't have to with the MIG, which is, uh, okay, which is G-M-A-W, gas metal arc welding or MIG. You don't have to remove the slag, but the flux core you do. Flux cord electrode wire is more expensive, obviously, because it has that flux in it and they have to bend the wire uh, to make it actual wire from a flat sheet. The equipment is generally more expensive heavy duty than, well, like I said, it depends, you know, some of the better stuff, but usually most equipment that you buy will let you use either. So that's not as much of a limitation as it used to be. All right, so then we have gas tungsten arc welding or TIG welding. Let's see if this even works anymore, if the link works. Yeah, and, and here's what I'm saying with the TIG welding, if you look at it. See how it's real bright? You can see what's going on. And you've got your... Yeah, let me do it on the big screen. Of course, this is a good little demo here. And you see there's the gas for the various cleaning aluminum you have to clean really well. There's the tungsten electrode inside there. Different holder, a whole different setup. Nice. All right, well, anyhow, we can get more into it. But why TIG, why their brand diversion, you know, Miller type, blah, 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 blah. See what it says for why TIG, what they say. Here you can a well, aluminum, stainless steel, thin copper, let's see, chrome alloy, steel, metal alloy. You can do all kinds of What's good about TIG is, you have that filler rod that you, you know, tap as you need it to fill it up. You know, you can see if it's sagging in there too much and then you fill it. It's kind of more of an art and a skill, I think. But you get nice, pretty beads. It looks like they, they put little dimes on top of each other. I mean, they 
comes out beautifully if you can weld decent. And it has this little electrode holder where you put a tungsten electrode and you say, tungsten, what's tungsten? Well, if you look at a regular screw in round incandescent light bulb, it's a tungsten little element. Tungsten takes the most heat before it melts. And when it gets hot, if it's really thin, it illuminates. And so that's how your, uh, your light bulbs work. And because it withstands the highest heat, that's why they use it for electrodes for welding. And I mean, it'll gradually wear away, but it doesn't so much. You have to clean the tips every once in a while and all that. But um, And so it's really a non-consumable electrode. That's why you have to add the filler metal. That's like, it's not an electrode because that's not having to conduct anything. But this is to conduct to get your heat source. Uh, but you're not supposed to be depositing the tungsten in the well. That's just to get things hot enough. And then you add your filler metal like so. So anyhow, let's get back to where we were at. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, there we are. <clears throat> Alright. Um, a metal joining process in which an electric arc is struck between a non-consumable tungsten electrode, and we'll show you pieces of that. And the workpiece. Filler metal may or may not be used, and you saw that little, looks like a, a little stick welding electrode, but it has no flux on it. And you kind of tap that in as you need it. Again, is it going to be as fast as a MIG setup or a flux core? No, because it's not a big spool. Once you're through with that filler metal rod, then you got to stop, pick up, and get another filler metal rod. Constant current is of supply. So, it's not a constant voltage machine like your flux core and your MIG setup. This is like your stick welder. And like I said, if you buy one of these, you can also use them as stick welders. They're set up for that. Gas shielding is supplied. But they have this foot control when you get started. Adjust. So if anybody's ever played the organ, you have to worry about that foot control as well. Uh, and then your torch, but allows you to adjust how much you need to play with the, the amperage there um, to get it hot. And so it gives you a little more control, and that way you can get these nice, pretty, beautiful wells. I know I, I, I tried. I got like a quarter of a bead, but this one guy, I mean, that's all he was was a welder for a living, and he was working on his doctorate at the time that I was there. He helped teach these classes. And he was pretty good where he could weld thin, you know, aluminum cans. You know, your little Coke and Pepsi cans. He could, he could weld them together. So that's how much control you have with this. Okay. And, and it's good, like I said, if you're trying to uh, even weld on panels for your car or whatever. I mean, yeah, you can do it the MIG way, too, if you're pretty good at it. But this, you got all kinds of control. It's kind of nice. <laughs> Uh, and then your different types of electrodes. Again, non-consumable. These aren't supposed to melt. Pure tungsten uses a lower current, used on less critical and general purpose work, and it's the least expensive. Yeah, we have cheapest here. Uh, the thoriated tungsten, 2%, uh, is for your plasma arc welders, which we're going to get into in a minute. Uh, arc starting is uh, free from sputtering and flashing. Uh, greater arc stability maintains good end profile during welding. And this is for direct current straight polarity. Okay, we don't have all the settings reversed, the positive and the negative. So direct current straight polarity. Um, and that, that seems to work best that way. And these you kind of grind to a point. Now your zirconiated tungsten, just, you know, again, has a certain percentage of zircon. Uh, resistant to contamination of the weld. Uh, maintains good end profile during welding. Uh, used with uh, low amperage AC. So it doesn't matter when we have it set up for AC welding. This works best for aluminum. Now, like I said, the other one, you grind the tip till you get it kind of pointy. 
This one, you goose it up all the way, the amperage, and then you hit the foot pedal, and it causes it to melt that tip, and it turns round like a hemisphere. And that's how you get your tip. Can you imagine trying to grind a round tip all the time? But and then that works well. <clears throat> all right, then that, that shows you there. See what I'm saying? If you goose that pedal, it's going to melt that tip, and it gives you a nice rounded tip. Here you grind the tips. And again, that's for DC straight polarity, and then for the AC, like I said, that's what you do there. All right, that's your hemisphere important. Then there's high frequency alternating current. We'll get into that too. This shows you here's that main body of it taken apart. The back cap. Here's the collet that holds it. When you, you screw that in, it tightens it. You know, just like on a milling machine, the collet that holds that that milling cutter. Here's your actual tungsten electrode. Here's the cup that surrounds it, keeps all the gas in there. And your torch body that you hold. And then here's the gases that come in to it. All right, and this shows you uh, the gas, the conductors for current, you know, uh, your your nozzle that goes around it. These little ceramic ferrules, they're kind of brittle. You got to be careful with them. All right, so you say, and, and, and again, I've got some. Videos I'm going to show you, so you're saying, God, he's going over this quickly. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, let me just show you all this stuff, advantages, disadvantages, what it looks like, and then you'll actually see a guy welding with him, and he'll explain everything. Advantages of your TIG welding, gas, tungsten, arc welding, or TIG, uh, which is tungsten inert gas. High quality in a wide variety of metals, uh, minimal post weld cleanup. Excellent weld pool visibility, like I said, because it's such a bright light with that tungsten. Because think, that's why we use tungsten in our light bulbs, is it makes it so bright just a little bit. So you can imagine when you're bumping all those amps through it. I mean, it lights up the room. So you can see what you're doing. It's like welding without having the dark glasses. I mean, you still have that, that uh, <coughs> the helmet on and, and the shields. But it's just so bright, you can see what you're doing. I, I find it easier, you know. They say, "Oh, it's an art. It's a skill to take one." Yeah, I, you know, to get really good at it. But I like it because you can really see what you're doing. All position, little or no spatter, no slag. Nice, pretty welds when you do them correctly. To sum it up, uses a constant current power supply, just like your stick welders, the shielded metal arc welders. Gas shielding is supplied uh, by usually argon or helium, depending on what you're welding. Uses a non-consumable tungsten electrode, and we talked about the pure, the least expensive, the thoriated, and the zirconiated for mainly doing aluminum. Uh, high weld quality. All right. Disadvantages of your TIG is requires a relatively high degree of skill. Low deposition rate, low operator factor, like I said, because those filler rods, you're going to have to stop, flip up your helmet, get another one. Uh, equipment is delicate. You know, you've got foot pedals. You've got all these other things that you got to deal with. Now they have foot pedals that um, are battery operated, so they're wireless. Makes it a little easier. May require use of backing or purge gas. Okay, so uh, your, your gases end up running, obviously, a little more. Well, that basically shows you. You just got a new welding glove. I always like it when everything's brand new. It looks so nice. There's a little ceramic ferrule that, you know, ceramic takes a lot of heat. It keeps all the gas and tries to keep the heat in so it stays concentrated right where the weld is. And there they've ground the tip nice. Okay, now we're going to get into submerged arc welding. Saw. Sub arc. You'll hear them say it a lot of times. Sub arc. A metal joining uh, process wherein the heat for coalescence, you know, when they fuse together, is provided by an electric arc struck between the workpiece and the bare metal consumable electrode. All right, this is like a MIG welder, but it's different. It's big, huge. You'll see these big, huge um, wires. Um, and it travels on this track. It's set up to be automated. And sometimes they'll have two 
wires coming in or even three. And I know and when we the they had the uh at May conference in Panama City one time, there's this pipe well there. They're making all the pipes for all these pipelines across the country and Canada and all that. And there they are making them in Florida as far as they can get away. But anyhow, they're good at it. It's, it's, a, it's a German company kind of co-owned, I guess, 50-50. But they're using four of those. So it's kind of proprietary information. So they got four spools dumping into this making these and that way they can just do one pass and weld these pipes in one pass think of the money they save so it's pretty neat and there that comes in and then it's got this flux hopper like a hopper on an in injection molding machine in plastic and the flux just pours down in there and then so the actual weld is buried in this pile of flux so you don't even have to have a helmet and glasses on I mean it's good to have safety glasses but they don't have to be tinted or anything shades different shading uh, because it's buried in that it just kind of looks like a, a pile of dirt or sand and there's like a little light bulb underneath that you see when it starts welding so it's pretty cool you can actually watch the weld uh, and we'll, we'll get more into it hardest part is getting it all set up originally to start and then once it starts like I said it it, it goes along these tracks and you're in good shape so and that kind of shows you. Here it is, uh, uh, flux covers the weld zone in front of the wire, and uh, and then you get these big beads, and then you have to chip off the slag. But nice, wide, deep, beautiful, one pass beads. You can't beat. Them. Let's see. Yeah, here's kind of the thing. See, it looks like a pile of sand or dirt. <laughs> And then, depending on what, you can actually see like it's like red or yellow or whatever, an orangey color in there. Um, but nothing to where you even need sunglasses. You just look at it directly. Because if you look at other welding, because it's such a bright light, it will blind you. All right, it puts, and, and if it doesn't blind you, it puts spots in your eyes, and sometimes they have to. Um, put patches over your eyes for a couple of days or a week then finally your eyesight comes back so yeah you're not supposed to stare at anything bright it's like staring at the sun it's not too bright is it yeah well it is bright that's the problem but it's not too bright as an intelligence wise to look at all right yeah it, it usually you, you can tell if it hurts your eyes then you shouldn't be looking at it all right, all right sub arc here uh, High productivity with true deposition rates as high as 100 pounds per hour. Yeah, I mean, it can really dump the material there. Travel speeds up to 150 inches per minute, single wire, or as high as 220 inches per minute with multiple electrodes. And like I said, I've seen up to four electrodes. Operator factor, the OF, approaching 100%. And there's big spools. And usually what happens is, well, you're only running one piece of pipe. You know, that's 20, some we, we saw were 40 foot lengths. Maybe they're even bigger than that. They were huge, 60 foot. I mean, it was, it was interesting, some of this pipe. And one pass, man, and you're done. Uh, deepest penetration up to one and a half inches thick and a single pass with little or no smoke. I, I think they had it up to two inches. It was, it was interesting. Kind of. High operator uh, comfort, no visible arc or spatter, high weld quality and repeatable results. Usually fully automated, like I said, exceptional control, environmentally friendly. Now here's one with three, three wires. Look at that, in tandem. So there's your electrodes down there that do the welding. This thing is your flux coming down in the flux hopper. And then you have a vacuum, what they're saying is that sucks up any that's left over that isn't fused together from the heat and then you can reuse it so there's like hardly any waste with this set but as you can see this isn't something you're just going to weld a car fender on yeah you'd blow a hole in that all the way through the car probably all right but for thick big plates all right works well um, this kind of shows you one with a track running on a table I know we had one at A&M that someone had donated. Uh, I mean, 
we we could have ones here at UT Tyler, but there's no room to put it if they donated it. But hopefully, uh, we'll see if our governor's going to sign that bill, and then we will get a new uh, College of Business and Technology building, so we'll have a little more space. So that would be nice. We'll see what happens. That's that's the next building that's going to be made at UT Tyler. All right, and then this kind of shows you a dumping all that material there. One's dumping the flux, and then one's the actual wire electrode in there that's buried under there. And as you can see, one pass, big, huge weld. When before, you'd have to do one weld here, then two welds here, then three welds here, then four welds. Here, you can do it all in one pass. Look at that. Then you say, well, um, how do you do one going this way? Well, you have these rollers, and this thing spins while the setup's right there, and that way you could weld right around. So you know how pipe welding, doing it with stick welding, I mean, that's the operator having to move around and get all that. Here, and no, all this baby can just spin around on you. It's nice. And then it shows you the different types of electrodes for that. And it talks about manganese percentages of manganese and that a hard grayish white metallic element used as an alloying agent to give steel toughness so instead of making it real brittle it makes it strong and still a little flexible and tough because there's hard and there's tough hardness you know it's making stuff harder and harder but the harder you make it the more brittle it gets and it can break so it just depends toughness you know it doesn't make it as hard. All right, and then it shows you the different types and I guess the kiln and stuff. K, yeah, where is it? Yeah, killed, killed. So if it's silicon killed wire. So the first letter uh, following letter E indicates the manganese content of the wire as shown in the table we just showed you. One or two digits following the manganese uh, class letter indicates an approximate carbon content for the electrode. So, I mean, if you had to decipher all of this. Or if you had to order this stuff, they expect that you know something about it because you took this class. Letter K follows the digits. is sometimes used. This letter indicates that the steel was manufactured from one that was silicon killed. Silicon killed wire has a greater silicon content than the wire used for the other electrode wire. Silicon is a deoxidizing agent that helps prevent porosity. So it depends if you need real, you know, if you need better like x-ray type wells, then this would be the, and it's, it's more expensive, so it just depends on what you're looking for. Sometimes a suffix of N is used, you know, instead of K, to indicate that the wire is nuclear grade and can be used for nuclear welding applications. Uh, in, uh, let's say, EM13KYR. Uh, e indicates electrode. M indicates medium manganese uh, class. 13 indicates approximately 0.13%, not 13%, carbon. And K indicates that it's silicon killed. So, pretty good stuff. So, it, it is nuclear is a whole nother issue. So they have special grades for that, for your own safety. You know, we don't want any more three-mile um, meltdowns, you know, back in the day when I was growing up. Or Chernobyl's, or even that Japanese uh, little incident there with the older style nuclear power plants. Now, if you set them up right, you shouldn't have any issues. Uh, you know, France, I think that's all they have now is nuclear power, and they've had that for years, so... If you keep track of it, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and again, that shows you all the different stuff. I'm not going to test you on all of that. But that's just, you know, in case somebody asks you so you don't look stupid, especially if you're supposed to be the supervisor of these people. And then the current ranges for subarc, depending, if you look, the thicker it gets, obviously it's going to take more to melt it. You know, look at that. We were talking 200 amps before on one of our welding units. 4,000 amps. You got 3 8 inch diameter wire. That's pretty thick. So think of 3 8 on a ruler. And then our arc speed. 
like I said, if you have three wires, I mean, look how much more material you can deposit. And you can get a thicker, deeper weld and one pass. And, and that's what you're looking for. It shows you all the different types depending the smaller type and then getting way up there. Variations, like we said, two wire system with a same power source, two wire systems where you have separate power sources because you're running so many amps, three wire system with separate power source for each of those wires, iron powder addition to the flux as well, and, and plus all the flux that's uh, deposited on there. So you can have a flux core. So you can get real quality welds. So you can do a flux core version of this submerged arc where it's dumping all that flux too. So it just depends on what you're looking for, the quality of the weld. You know. And that's a better picture of it there where you know it's dumping the material and fusing it and then going along. And then there'll be a vacuum behind it sucking up all the extra. But see you can weld real wide, big, thick welds thick material. And here they're adding more material uh, so making the surface hardness of this maybe it's worn down or fixing something. Here they're welding. Let's say they bent this piece of metal to make this big huge diameter pipe and they're welding it here. Cleaning it all up with the vacuum. Alright so the advantage is high quality of the well deposit, extremely high deposition rates, which we talked about in speed, smoother uniform finish well with no spatter, little or no smoke, no arc flash, thus minimal need for protective clothing and uh, eye protection, uh, as in uh, the, the, the dark tinted type lenses that you wear in your uh, welding helmets. High utilization of electrode wire, easily automated for high operator factor, uh, manipulative skills normally not involved at all because it runs on a track of some type. Just a matter of setting it up, you got to kind of know what you're doing. But other than that, it's not bad. Once you've learned how to do that, it's pretty good. Limitations, limited to flat position only, obviously because it's depositing so much material. Use only to weld mild and low alloy steels. High input, slow cooling can be a problem when welding quenched and tempered steels. Uh, the inability to see the weld puddle can be a problem in reaching the root of the groove. But usually you'll set it up, you'll do a little pass, stop it, clean it up and look at it, see if you're on the money. Then if so, then you let the thing rip. Uh, so to sum it all up, again, consumable wire fed electrodes shielded by a granular flux that we saw coming out of that hopper, which partially vaporizes, has a slag deposit on the weld, it's capable of high welding speeds and deposition rates, produces high quality welds on very thick work pieces, is adaptable to fully automated welders. So yeah, it's all automated. You saw it. Plasmark. Finish it up here. Our Plasmark welder. A metal joining process in which heating is produced with a constricted arc between a non-consumable electrode and a work piece. Uh, shielding is obtained from hot ionized gas emitted from around the orifice. So this is basically what this is, is TIG welding only gone to the next step, which gets it even hotter. And when you get gas so hot, it becomes where it's ionized and it becomes a plasma, super hot. Okay, and it's just the nature of chemical compositions of things. So when you get that, what you can do is you can pinpoint it, make it smaller, then goes deeper so you can get deeper penetration and a less heat affected zone. So it's narrower and it directs it down and gives you a nice, just like if you've seen a plasma weld or a plasma cutter versus an oxyacetylene cutting. I know we haven't gotten into that, but we will. If you've ever cut something with an oxyacetylene torch or seen somebody, it's kind of a rough, jagged edge. Well then, not only can these plasma, you can set them up as welders, there's also just cutters too. Or you can even take a welder and make a cutter out of it. But it just depends on which type you're buying. But um, you can cut with these things. And what it does is it cuts quicker, faster, uh, or, or and neater. It gives you a neater edge, more control than actually cutting it with a oxyacetylene 
type torch, but you know that's inexpensive. You can buy one of those setups for a hundred bucks at uh, well, I think they even sell them at Walmart, but I know I've seen them at Lowe's and Home Depot and what have you. Versus a Plasmark welder, I mean they're like five hundred on up and five and Plasmark cutter, uh, but uh, you get what you pay for. You're doing this for a living, and you need nice, small, neat stuff cut out and what have you. You probably wouldn't have to finish it when you're done. So that's the beauty of it. So one less process to do. So what is plasmark welding? It is a process that is similar to other types of arc welding, but the electrode is inserted into a small nozzle. This allows a separation from the inert shielding gas and tends to aim the resulting arc in a high-intensity plasma stream that is capable of attaining incredibly high speed and high temperature arcs. Major advantage of the Plasmark method is precision welds that could be made on thinner metals. This allowed welding to be used in many applications where regular welding methods were incapable of handling the precision required. Again, this is good for all types of alloys too. <clears throat> Plasma welding machines and processes can be manually or automated uh, they tend to produce very straight and thin welds. The nozzle allows much less wandering of the arc compared to your normal TIG and MIG weld. So again, it constricts, they call it sometimes a constricted arc. And uh, so you don't have as much of a heat affected zone either. And it shows you, it's basically showing you a TIG type setup. But if you look at them, they're, they're different. But they're similar, that's the deal. It's like taking a TIG setup, changing a few extra things, and you can have your plasma gas, and then you can have your shielding gas. So you have two different gases instead of just one. And they could be the same type of gas depending on the material that you're cutting. But it gives you more control to give you a more constricted, tighter flow of the heat. And so you can make thinner welds, but also in thick material, or you can lighten it up and go faster and make nice welds on thin material. Gives you a lot of control. That kind of shows it to you. you know, again, it kind of looks similar to your TIG and even your MIG. You know, but look how narrow this is versus you know, the big thing. Okay, a plasma is a gas which is heated to extremely high temperature and ionized so that it becomes electrically conductive. Similar to TIG, the plasmark welding process uses the plasma to transfer electric arc to a workpiece. The metal to be welded is melted by the intense heat. Only again, it's like TIG, only it gets hotter. In the plasma welding torch, a tungsten electrode is located within a copper nozzle. Uh, having a small opening at the tip, a pilot arc is initiated between the torch electrode and nozzle tip to get the thing started. The arc is then transferred to the metal to be welded. By forcing the plasma gas and arc through a constricted orifice, the torch delivers a high concentration of heat to a small area. With high performance welding equipment, the plasma process produces exceptionally high quality welds. So, plasma gases are normally argon. The torch also uses secondary gas, which can be argon or argon hydrogen or helium, which assists in shielding the molten weld puddle, thus minimizing. Again, depending on what you're welding. And it shows you argon, carbon, or carbon and low alloy steels, uh, copper and zinc. Uh, argon with an oxygen uh, mix for stainless steel, keyhole, welds, root passes. Uh, and then helium for melt-in welds, copper stainless steel, keyhole welds as well. So just depends on what you're doing. Again, helium's even though helium's about the same price as argon, it depends. They fluctuate since it flows more because it wants to rise quicker. You have to have higher flow rates, so you end up using more. So it ends up being more expensive. And then this shows you a special. The, the, the gun cut away of it and see you can have narrow welds with all this extra equipment. And, and again, this is just showing you a TIG welder, but it kind of gets you the idea. It's the same as TIG, only it gets hotter 
gives you a more a, a narrower weld, uh, so less heat affected zone, and you can do deeper welds or you can even do lighter welds. It gives you more control. Uh, it, it, it's just it's a more improved machine. You know, it's it's just like over the years you have a V8 engine. I know in the old hot rods I have in the uh, garage. And then now they got, you know, the same type of V8s, but they have roller on them. Uh, and, and some of them have uh, overhead cams and stuff like that. It's just an improvement on a process. And if you look at that, here's the Plasmark Weld Aluminum. I mean, my God, you can barely see the ripples. It just looks like someone took a round cylinder and inserted it in there. I mean, it's just beautiful. Look at that. Wow. I mean, if, if you're a welder, this will start making you drool. All right. But if you're not, you're saying, okay, let's move on to the next slide. All right. So it tells you there. <laughs> what they're doing here, oh, yeah, I meant to say is when you weld, right, you leave a depression at the end. So you'll put an extra backing plate so you can get a nice, perfect weld. Then you can cut that off if you have to. Or if you're adding another piece to it, then you can continue on welding from there. This backer plate holds it all together. <clears throat> all right, Torch uses a non-consumable electrode, 2% thoriated, just depends on what you're doing. Uh, and inert gas passes by the electrode at high speed. Additional shielding is provided outside of the arc region and the power supply, again, because it is so much like TIG and stick welding, it's a constant current. Shielding gas, argon, carbon, and low alloy steels, argon oxygen, stainless keyhole wells, root passes, and helium for higher heat concentrations. And then if you're doing plasma arc cutting, you use nitrogen, which is fairly inexpensive. I mean, they're even putting nitrogen now, nitrogen-filled tires. Uh, what's good about nitrogen doesn't expand like you know just putting regular air compressed air in your tire because uh, you know in the winter time it gets colder and denser it shrinks and then you have less air pressure in your tire and your tires are low and then it expands in the summer when you're on the highway and all that too so nitrogen is fairly inexpensive and compressed air obviously is even cheaper yet so to sum it all up, uses non-consumable tungsten electrodes, requires inert gases such as argon, helium, uh, and let's see what else we got, hydrogen, for the, the shielding gas and to form the plasma. Okay, that's when you get into more of these expensive ones. Then, you know, for cutting and all that, like I said, then the other gases are just compressed air and nitrogen, which are fairly expensive. Produces a high temperature arc of, look at this, 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit. When you need to melt steel, about five 6,000 degrees. So, I mean, you can move with this. Produces high quality welds with 100% penetration. So, anyway. And then it shows you, here's your gas tungsten. Fairly simple in here because we have two of them. Here's your plasmark. But again, you're going to have a wider weld, more of a heat affected zone. Here it goes down deep penetration, gives you a better weld. Advantages, torch to work distance is less critical than gas tungsten arc welding. High heat concentration allows for smaller heat affected zones. You'll see this has all the time. You wonder, what is this? All right, higher travel speeds, higher quality welds. I mean, it's, it's more expensive, the welders, but you get what you pay for. And it's a newer thing that has come out, and it's it's good. Disadvantages, equipment cost is much higher, about two to five times higher than a regular TIG welder. All the price is coming down. I've seen them, you know, because there's a lot of competition now. Uh, consumes more gas. But, you know, again, if you need a high-quality weld, or if you're not a real good welder and you're trying to make stuff and it just looks really bad, then this makes you look better. Just like guitar playing. You get a guitar, more expensive guitar with a better neck. The strings get closer to the fingerboard, the frets, and you can play a lot better and a lot faster. All right, then we're going to have.